Today we're looking back at the Gospel of John, uh, but we'll be looking <clears throat> at something that John doesn't actually record. We know he was there, but he doesn't actually record it. Uh, he captures something in the same evening that we're going to look at that communicates Jesus' heart for what we're talking about today. So you'll get it as we go. Um, Luke 22 verse 19 says this. And before I read that, you saw there's communion tables on the sides. We haven't forgotten. We're going to do that right at the end, okay? So hopefully what we share today will speak into our sharing communion at the end. So Luke 22 verse 19, if you have your Bibles, it says, He took bread... He gave thanks and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Every message has a purpose. The purpose of today's message is to bring light to what Jesus intended when he said, do this to remember me. Because I don't, I don't know if we have it right all the time. So we want to bring light to that. So do what was he saying? Do this to remember me, but do what? Do what? I think Jesus was saying as a community to celebrate your deliverance from the kingdom of darkness because of me. I think that's what he was saying. Uh, but to get some context, I want to go through quite a bit of scripture this morning. So, as usual, I'm going to ask you to take out your Bibles, and we're going to hope that I can read my own Bible, um, because I spend a lot of time reading my phone Bible and my computer Bible, and when I open my paper Bible, I find that the words are a lot smaller than the long, last time I looked at them. So, I, I think that's a, a thing that happens as you get older. I'm not getting older <laughs> at all. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12, from verse 1. We're going to read 13 verses. It says this, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Am I in the right book? Yes. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month, every month, you shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male for the first year. Uh, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with the unleavened bread and with the bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Sounds like a bri. More than a bri. Eh? Verse 9. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled uh, in water, but roasted in the fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. Verse 10. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, 
both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Yeesh. It's quite a hectic, a hectic event. Um, so my problem is when I read the Bible, I start seeing pictures. And so I imagine these things. And um, that's why I said it sounds like a bra. And just imagine the whole nation, apparently there were millions of them, um, slaughtering a lamb, burning it on the fire, ready to leave because God's going to deliver them from the oppressor. It's a huge event. The Jewish people, now we, remember this is context. So we, we're looking at that verse in Luke 22 verse 19 where Jesus broke the bread and he said, this is my body. Um, that event when Jesus was, was with his disciples was the Passover meal. They were celebrating this event. You understand? The Jewish people had this message wired into their history through the Passover. The blood of the Passover lamb was painted onto the doorposts, which were a sign that death would pass them by. The blood was an indication that they were wholly set apart from the rest of the, the, the Egyptians, from being included in the judgment against the false gods of Egypt. Jesus was saying, whenever you do this, do what? Celebrate your deliverance from the clutches of the enemy, your deliverance into the kingdom of God. Whenever you do this, whenever you celebrate that Passover meal, remember me. And not because we deserve it, but because of the blood sacrifice of a spotless lamb, the Son of God. Amen? So the title, that's just a bit of an introduction. The title of my message today is Do This to Remember Me. Throughout church history, there's, there's been two primary sacraments. Who knows what a sacrament is? Anybody? What's a sacrament? Yes? The word sacrament, do you know what it means? I'll tell you what it means. Somebody shouts it out? No? Okay. A sacrament. So, so throughout church history, there's two sacraments that we've, been, that we've held to. Um, these are baptism and the Lord's Supper or communion. A sacrament is a symbolic ritual commanded by Christ himself and confirmed by the command and practice of the apostles in the early church. The word sacrament comes from the Latin sacramentum. Just a little bit of a word study, which means an oath or a solemn vow. In the mid-16th century, the Council of Trent defined a sacrament as a, a visible sign of an invisible grace. It's not that rituals like marriage, confirmation, ordination, etc., lack grace, uh, or that there's no biblical basis for them, but in their zeal to call the church to measure its actions against Christ himself, the reformers argued that none of the sacraments apart from baptism and communion were commanded by Christ himself in the Bible. Okay, so that's a sacrament. I remember when I was much younger, I was a teenager, I was, you've heard me say this many times, I, I went to reform school when I was young, I was naughty, and so I was sent to a reform school by the magistrate's court, uh, and I was sent to a school that I couldn't get expelled from. <laughs> that was frustrating. Um, I was a bit of a con man when I was younger, so uh, I found a way out. Believe it or not, um, I, the one year I came back to East London and uh, I got my mom to sign me up for the art side at Tech. And the law says that if a school accepts you, that you don't have to go back. And so I had no school in the Eastern Cape that accepted me because I was too naughty. 
And my mom booked me into the art side of tech, and for some reason, they accepted me. And so after ending Standard 8, I didn't go back. I, I found a way out. Anyway, that's not the story I wanted to tell. Um, the story I wanted to tell was for two or three years, I was in a school in George for Naughty Boys, and they forced us to go to church on a Sunday. So as a group, we would go out, we'd go to the church of our choice, and I remember we chose to go to the, it was, I think it's called St. Mark's Cathedral. Who knows George? Anyone know George here? There's an Anglican cathedral in George. It's quite a nice looking building. You know, it's an old building, and this is where we went to go to church. The reason we selected the Anglican cathedral was because there was a nice secluded space at the back of the building that we could go smoke weed before we went in. And um, so we would go in and we'd sit in the two back rows, high as cuts, um, with the, if you've ever smoked weed, it makes your, your mouth very dry. So we'd sit there and we'd want something to drink and then communion would come up. And so uh, the boys, we'd all line up stinking of dacha and we'd wait and we'd go and we'd have communion. And uh, we worked out how to get nice big sips out of that goblet. Because they used to, now in the Anglican church, they use old brown sherry, okay? So they fill the, this goblet. It's a massive thing. It's like, they fill this thing and then he holds it with two hands and he comes and he pours it in your mouth. And if you put just the right amount of pressure on the goblet, you can push it against his tummy and he can't lift it. <laughs> so you're able to take nice big sips from this goblet. <laughs> so that's what we used to do. So we, we weren't just high. We'd get a little bit uh, tipsy as well. Um, and the priest was a very nice guy. He cared for the boys. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, I wonder if that's what Jesus had in mind when he said, do this to remember me. Lining up in an Anglican church, going to take a sip of a big silver goblet. I wonder if that's what he had in mind. You want another story? I'll tell you another story. It's, it's part of my sermon, so I can get carried away. Um, so we were having a discipleship school, the other, uh, a discipleship journey a couple of weeks back, and um, the, we had communion the one week, and Laurent came in with a little box of these. You see what it is? It's, it's, it's quite ingenious. It's a, little, it's a little communion glass, and strapped on the top, a little wafer so all neatly packaged for the individual communion experience I remember I took one out of the box and I looked at it and I was like these were the thoughts these were the exact words that came to my mind I, I thought to myself is this what Jesus had in mind a nice little individual package. You can go into a corner and you can have your little communion and feel good about yourself. Is that what he had in mind? I doubt it. <laughs> now, I don't want to, let me just say this before I carry on. I don't want to, my intention today is to not to offend you, okay? Although you might get offended. And my intention today is not to talk down this practice that we do and that we're going to do today. That's not my intention. My intention today is to draw attention to what this really means. What did Jesus have in mind when he started this? 
And I don't want to say this, okay? Because it's so much more than that. So I'd like you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Thank you, Lord. I actually put it in my notes so I don't have to open my paper Bible. There we are, there. There we go. The cup of blessing. This is Paul speaking, okay? He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. That word, communion, okay, it's not actually an English word. If you've done a little bit of Bible study, you'll know that that's not actually an English word. It's actually a Greek word because it's in the New Testament. There we go. It's a Greek word that says koivoi something. <laughs> I don't know how they would say that. But there is an English translation. Uh, the word is koinonia. Who knows that word? Koinonia. Koinonia. Um, and I can read you all the Greek, and st- okay, I've got a Greek dictionary, and so I can read you all the definitions. You might not understand the way it's st- structured, but I'll read it for you anyway. It says, from G2844, partnership that is, literally, participation or social intercourse or pecuniary benefaction to communicate action, communion, contribution, fellowship. Almost gibberish, but not quite. Um, But that last word is quite important. Fellowship. Fellowship. Koinonia means the idealized state of fellowship and unity that should exist within the Christian church or the body of Christ. Can I read that again? The idealized state of fellowship and unity that should exist within the Christian church, the body of Christ. We see the first example of koinonia in the book of Acts 2, verse 42, when it says they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in breaking of bread and prayers. This is a picture of koinonia. In Philippians 2, verse 1 to 4, it says this, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is koinonia. Koinonia, communion. What does Paul say? Is not the drinking of the wine and the breaking of the bread, the koinonia, the communion, the fellowship of the body of Christ? Is that not what it is? Or is it about a little bit of juice and a little bit of bread. Today I want to contend for the idea that the modern church has lost the communal context of these practices in its public gatherings focused environment. We've also lost the sight, lost sight of Jesus' original intention of fostering the ideal environment for the church to thrive, grow, and multiply. And that by understanding what Jesus was trying to do, we can truly become the community 
the church that he envisioned from the start. Because that's what we want to become. The thought that was in Jesus' head when he, when he did this with his disciples, what was he thinking of? That's who we want to become. Do you agree? When, when Jesus said to his disciples, do this to remember me, he was not talking about drinking grape juice or wine and crackers as a, simple, a symbol of the cross. It was a call to practice as a direct result of his work on the cross, deep, meaningful, relational community as his church, the very people that he's building today. Amen. Breaking a loaf of bread and drinking wine was part of a much deeper tradition than just a symbolic reminder of what Jesus did for us. It was part of a celebration that was practiced for centuries. The Passover. And Jesus was saying to his disciples that he was the fulfillment of this age-old practice. Him. He's saying, in, in essence, he's saying, guys, when you celebrate the Passover, when you celebrate that moment that Israel was delivered from the Egyptians and God passed judgment, and you were delivered from that, when you celebrate that, you're celebrating me, what I'm about to do for you with my blood. It's me. Remember me. Remember me when you come together, when you gathered like this. When your laptop misbehaves. To get a clear picture of what I'm trying to say is, we, we, we've got to go back to the model, the nucleus event. You know, the thing that's recorded in, in John, but also in Luke, because we'll start with Luke. So we go back to Luke, Luke, um, Luke 22, and we, we read from verse 14. Jennifer, if I linger up here too long, she's going to start to flash her phone, flash at me. <laughs> um, Luke 22. From verse 14. It says, when the hour had come, When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Now, what's happening here is Jesus has told the disciples to prepare the Passover meal. So they are about to celebrate the Passover. But he's also, um, this is also his last, we call it the last supper before his crucifixion. So this is a very significant event for more than one reason. And so they prepared the Passover meal. And so it says here, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them, and I want you to hear the affection in Jesus' voice. You know? Because, you know, when you read your Bible, sometimes when you, if you read a little bit slower and you try and put yourself into the picture, you try and hear the words rather than just reading them. Sometimes you see things that you didn't see before, you know? And so when you read this, I want you to hear the affection in Jesus' voice. He says this, he says, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Sure. Sure. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will no, not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. 
do this to remember me. Likewise, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold the hand of my betrayer, and he carries on a bit, and he goes on to explain leadership to them. What I want you to see while we're looking at these scriptures is the environment that Jesus and the disciples are in. If you can for one moment forget about the juice and the bread and look at the environment they're in. These are his closest companions. He loves these guys. He's, Jesus is thinking, the future of my church is in their hands. Um, and there was, there's no other place I would rather be today than here with these guys, these young men. They were young men. This is where I want to be. Verse 25 says this, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is, it is not he who sits at the table, uh, sorry, it is not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as one who serves. Now, this is where we get to John. We're looking back at John, remember? And so this moment where he's speaking about how we serve one another, John elaborates on this point. So I was going back through the sermons that have been preached over the last couple of weeks, and I couldn't find who had shared on this. I missed it somewhere. But it's a very important, it's, it's a very important portion, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a pinnacle event for the church. You know, like I always say, the Great Commission is very important because Jesus, it was the last instruction he gave to the disciples before he ascended. This command is just as, an, as important. It's the last command he gave before he went to the cross. It's a pinnacle event. And so let's take a deeper look at what that means in John 13 from verse one. If you love scripture, you're in good company. If you don't, we're gonna pray for your salvation. <laughs> John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil had already entered into the heart of Judas. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments. He took a towel and he girded himself. He dressed like a slave, basically. And after that, he poured water into a, a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel which was around his waist. And then he, then he came to Simon Peter and, and Peter said to him, Lord, you're washing my feet. And Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will, uh, you will after this. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet, Lord. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, wash you, you have no part in me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, oh, Peter, I so relate to Peter. I say some dumb things sometimes, just like Peter. And Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean. 
And he says, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, and therefore he said, you're not all clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done for you? Do you know? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord, and your teacher have washed your feet, here it comes. This is the very important command, okay? Then you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Serve one another. The breaking of bread. Now remember, before I carry on there, these two portions of Scripture is the same evening. They are snippets of the same evening. If you were watching a movie, you'd see the disciples preparing a room. You'd see them going and buying meat and, and getting all the stuff needed for the meal. You'd see them uh, preparing the venue. You'd see them like getting a little donkey to carry Jesus. Or was that another event? I don't know. But you'd see them doing all these events in preparation for the Passover. Then you'd see them come in and they would eat. And during that meal, you'd see which is common practice when we eat, you'd see them, they'd have a bit of drink and they'd have some bread and maybe there's a soup on the table and so you break the bread and dip it in the soup. Is that not what happened? And when he broke the bread during the meal, then he said, hey guys, when you do this, do what? When you celebrate the Passover, when you celebrate your deliverance, remember me. This is my body. Breaking the bread. It's my body. It's my body. The breaking of bread during the meal signified being part of something greater than yourself. When Jesus said things like, eat me, I am the bread of life. He was saying, partake of me. Experience me and my way of life. Live in me. These are not mystic sentiments. These are a practical call to follow Christ and the way he lives. Breaking bread is understood as shorthand for taking a meal together, which includes the notion of more than nourishment, but involves Fellowship, deep relational fellowship. When Jesus breaks bread, he is saying, partake of my body. Be part of what I'm about to die to achieve. How do you do this? How do you partake of what Jesus is about to die to achieve? Like this, this picture. When you see these people that have close relationships coming together, serving one another. He just gave us an example. This is how. Drinking of a cup during the meal was also a call to let this practice, this experience be central to your way of life. Remember, we're not talking about this only. What did he say? He said, this is my body. This is my body. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you're part of the body of Christ? This is my body. When you gather like this, remember me. When you gather like we did last night, remember me. How's my time? Okay, Jen's telling me to cut it short, okay. I wanna say one thing before I cut it short. There's, there's still a lot of information. 
Um, just one thing. In, in Corinthians, when Paul, when Paul addresses the Corinthians, he says to them, I'm not going to commend you. In other words, the way you're practicing your walk with Christ is not complimentary. And he rebukes them. And what, hap what was happening in the Corinthian church is there was partiality and divisions. And uh, I always try and explain it like this. If we have a community event and somebody leaves that event fe feeling like they've been left out, we've missed it. When we have a Christian gathering, when we come together as Christ's followers, people should feel like Christ himself has served them. They should leave you feeling like, I need to follow that guy. That's what we want to make a reality in our gatherings. And that's why Paul rebuked the Corinthians because that wasn't their reality. And uh, he says something to them. He says this, he says, I do not commend you. you and he, later on he says, you've not discerned the Lord's body. That's why he was rebuking them. You've not discerned the Lord's body. And when we gather and there's partiality and you have issues with this person and you rather eat your feast here and let them go hungry, when you operate like that, it's not commendable. It's not reflective of the Christ life that Jesus has called us to walk out. It's not reflective of the cross that's brought us salvation. And so he says, you've not discerned the Lord's body. And that's why I said to Jennifer earlier, um, Soba stole my, my little illustration when she said, I see you. Um, because this is a call to look into one another. There's, a, there's an African tradition, like she said. When you look at another person, when you greet them, not to just say, oh, hello, bye, but to say, I see you, I honor you, I recognize Christ in you. When last did you go to the shopping center and you see somebody that you recognize and you think, oh, I can't remember their name. So you try and dodge them. <laughs> That's not okay. If you see somebody that you recognize, even if you don't remember their name, go up to them and say, hi, I see you. I saw you. How are you? Are you well? I'm not talking about small talk. I'm talking about looking into the other person and looking for Christ himself and serving them and speaking to them as if Jesus was telling the truth. Do you believe Jesus was telling the truth? There's a scripture that says, um, I'm trying to be fast. Um, there's, a, there's a scripture that says, uh, Jesus tells a parable and he says, when you've done something for the least of these, you've done it for me. You know? He takes those things personal. The cross says that we're part of a family bought by the blood of Christ and we are called to treat one another as if they were Christ himself. Amen? So where does this leave us? Jesus came to build this community, eh? Jesus said, do this to remember me. Do what? Come together as his body. Serve one another. See Christ in one another. Care for one another. Live for one another. Do that when you do this. And remind yourself of why we have this privilege 
it's because of a cross, because of the sacrifice of the Son of God. Amen. Amen.